Sadly, this bearded dragon was abandoned. Allow me to explain. A few weeks ago, I was running errands and getting crickets for my animals. As I entered the store, there was commotion going on at the front, which I ignored because I was on a mission. As an employee was getting crickets for me, another walked up to me holding a huge bearded dragon, which she said caught me off guard. Do you want them? I thought she was joking at first, but she proceeded to tell me that a family dropped him off in a fully furnished tank just minutes before. That's what all the commotion was. Supposedly, they had him for a little over a year and didn't have time for him any longer. They left him at the store, and now he needed a new home. I asked if I could hold him for myself so I could do a proper look over and assess the situation. It was immediately obvious that he was big to say the least. I also noticed a slight kink in the tip of his tail, which could be an indicator of a calcium deficiency, and he's missing the end of one of his toes. Despite all of this, he seemed very alert, and if I'll be honest, the second I saw that little reptile face looking back at me, it was love at first sight. Now this is the sad reality of many reptiles, as I'm sure you know. People get these animals on a whim while at the store, or get inspired by a YouTube video. It's no secret that I'm an advocate of responsible animal keeping, but doing this is a commitment. Most reptiles are long-lived, even under suboptimal conditions. We're talking upwards of 20 years or more, and even though they're not the same as a dog or cat, they need a lot of love. People often get bored of their pets, and this happens. Now I'm not out here seeking rescues, but they keep finding their way to me. Cynthia, for example, had no human interaction for five years in her previous situation while the family who got Henry didn't know how to care for him properly. There's also a bunch of goldfish I got from someone who didn't want their pond anymore. These are not unique scenarios, and there's a common thread. Either the animals were no longer wanted, or the means of care were unavailable. Anyway, I agreed to take the dragon, formerly known as Lizard. Both of our lives were about to change forever. And by the way, we named him Big Tony. I mean, he's big, and he looks like a Tony, right? Here's the setup Tone came in. I'm not here to hate on the previous owners by any means, but it's a scenario we see often. It's due to poor research and bad products. We have the internet now, so there's really no excuse in the research department, but why are we still marketing walnut shells as an appropriate substrate, or heat rocks as a good solution? Not to mention the reptile carpet which I found under the walnuts, or the undersized enclosure. They're usually marketed for adult animals, which is misleading to consumers. Sorry for the micro rant, but this is something that frustrates me to no end, and this seemed like a good opportunity to talk about it. Anyway, after dismantling and disinfecting the enclosure, I made a temporary setup for Tony. As for the new one, I wanted to go big while keeping it fairly cost effective. PVC board seemed like the best material for the job. I got two pieces from Home Depot and made calculations. I determined how to optimize the material and make the enclosure as large as possible with minimal cuts. Luckily, no special tools are needed to do this. Anything used for wood works well. After cutting everything down, I drilled holes along the edges where the boards join. Since this is PVC, I used cement to bond the pieces together. I applied it along the appropriate edges and locked them together with the screws. Otherwise, I would have had to use clamps and whatnot, and I just didn't want to deal with that. I dressed the substrate tray first, followed by a side, then the back and the other side. At the top, I accounted for a canopy using various strips I cut out before. I made a few aluminum window screens as well. I simply constructed the frames, secured the screen with spline, and I was good to go. I just applied silicone to create a gasket and screwed them down. Instead of using another PVC board on the top, I decided to use a sheet of corrugated plastic, which I stapled down. However, there was an issue. The canopy boards are really thin, which caused it to bow at the top. To mend this, I simply screwed a different board to the top. I also used the cement to attach glass tracks to the front and accounted for side ventilation. I cut holes and stapled screen over them. Additionally, I wanted a better aesthetic than a white box. I simply cut down thin plywood to perfectly match the outside, which was glued down, stained, and polyed for a finished look. Along all of the edges on the inside, I applied silicone designed for plastics for good measure. It probably would have held water as is, but I wanted to be sure. It held water perfectly. I assembled a stand as well using various techniques and dimensional lumber. At this point I could finally get to the fun part, the scape. I measured the tank and cut down foam accordingly. Then I applied dots of silicone and stuck them to the inside of the enclosure. This gave me a good foundation to build on. 
I broke down the remaining bits and siliconed them together in stacked formations. I wanted a stacked slate look for the stones, and these base pieces allowed me to do exactly that. I sliced through several times to create a direction to follow. Then I used a knife to cut along these lines and rip out sections. This took nearly 9 hours to pull off, but the results looked good. I just did a quick pass with the heat gun and covered the exterior with a slurry consistency grout. This will help strengthen and preserve the foam. Once dry, I applied various layers of dry lock, starting with black to fill the gaps and create a base layer. On top of this, I added a few dry brush layers of brown. The result looks good, but I'll do much more with them later. Before adding them to the tank, I accounted for a giant piece of driftwood. This was actually the wood we used in the aqua shell tank from a few years back. I've been saving it for the perfect project, and this seemed like the time. To keep it up at the proper elevation, I stacked a few bricks under it. I decided this partly on what looked good, but also according to UV exposure. I made sure to burn the light in before I did my reading to ensure everything was accurate. Now I didn't want to actually use the bricks to hold the branch up, so I drilled directly through the enclosure and locked it down with 6 structural screws. These allowed me to create the proper cantilever effect I imagined. I worked the stones around this, keeping a horizontal configuration as I did. I used toothpicks to hold them onto the foam while I escaped. Then I locked them in with expanding foam. After it cured, I carved things down accordingly. I also used a wire brush on the flat areas to speed up the process. The idea is that the rocks are embedded into a sandy hillside or something of that nature. That's where the paint really came into play. As usual, I painted everything black to get the base layer. My inspiration from here was something like what you'd actually see in the Bearded Dragon's natural range. Adding various dry brush layers on this allowed me to do exactly that. I put on the brown first, then I worked in the signature sienna hues, followed by accent colors. I really liked the result, but I wanted to work in more driftwood as well. This piece fit perfectly on the side, I just had to lock it in with epoxy. Once cured, I hid that with super glue and sand. Finally, I rinsed everything down to remove excess debris. Looking at it now, it's a shame I didn't use this for something with a water feature, because that cascading effect was awesome. With the background mostly complete, I mixed up the substrate directly in the tank. This blend consists of topsoil, which I sifted out before use to remove twigs and stones, cocoa fiber, play sand, and excavator clay. This mix is pretty cool because it will work well without a false bottom due to the depth. The clay will also allow it to hold burrows, which should be a cool feature to have if Tony decides to dig. The depth will also be ideal for plants. I selected a few large items that should hold up and are safe if ingested. First up was this giant elephant bush. I had to cut off the top to get it to fit right, but I should be able to start a new plant from the cutting. A spineless prickly pear cactus seemed like a good move as well. After those, I added a few more branches using the techniques from before. I could finally add the boards to the canopy at this point as well. I put a bee knob on each for extra detail. As for the tracks, I simply cut down glass to fit. Down in the substrate, I added a few branches, leaf litter, and an assortment of botanicals for the cleanup crew. I sprinkled Australian desert sand over top of this to blend better with the background. From there, I dug shallow holes for the isopod colonies. I concealed these later on, but doing it this way allowed them to venture out on their own accord while I buried the springtail colonies completely. Finally, I placed his food dish right behind the cactus. I've been feverishly working on this for just over a month now, and I'm so excited to finally have it done. From the top to the bottom and everything in between, I tried my best to make the setup as elaborate and functional as possible. That's easier said than done though. Take the plants for example. I tried to add more initially, but I think less is more in this case. The hardscape is also very intentional. I used it to create many climbing spaces, ledges, caves, and areas of exploration. In other words, things to keep him stimulated. From the front it may look clustered, but it's actually much more open than it appears. Truly, there's easy access to nearly every feature of this setup. Designing the hardscape like this, and going as large as I did, also makes it much easier to account for microclimates. Excluding the canopy, the enclosure itself measures 69 inches wide, 28 inches from front to back, and 38 inches tall, which is a volume of 318 gallons. For reference, he was living in a 40 gallon prior to this. 
Of course, I have UV going across the entire tank to provide various exposures, as I explained before. I also have LEDs for the plants and visibility. The cool thing is that the Arcadia system allows you to link everything together, keeping cord management clean. I also have a heating implement that's hooked up to a thermostat. All of this allows for multiple hot spots, basking areas, cool spots, and so on. It is missing one thing though. Although a little overwhelmed at first, it didn't take long for Big Tony to make himself at home. I thought he was going to climb up the driftwood first, but he tricked me and went down into the cave area. He surveyed that for a little, popped back out to see what I was doing, and then made his way into the log. This could be a hiding area, but it also has a hole in the back that he can pass through. It was awesome to see him use this feature, and it affirmed to me that I used this branch in the correct setup. From there, he crawled back down and surveyed the land a bit. He couldn't seem to stay out of that cave though, and went back for another look. This time, he spent about 10 minutes digging. This brought a huge smile to my face. I realized that in no time of his life has he been able to properly do this. Now he has 10 inches of substrate to dig into his heart's content. Once he had enough of that, he emerged to the front with a ball of substrate on his nose. At last, he finally made his way up to the branch. This is what I've wanted to see the whole time. He just looks so regal in that spot and just as good as I imagined. After a while, he made his way across the background and onto one of the other basking spots. I expected him to prefer the branch, but I was mistaken. This spot's what he's been looking for the entire time. In the few weeks that I've spent with Tony, I've become extremely attached. I take him outside to get natural UV rays, I let him free roam my office, and he even naps on the couch while I play video games. I honestly never wanted a bearded dragon, but I knew if I ever got one, it would happen a little something like this. I try not to anthropomorphize the animals, but when he looked back at me, I just could sense him telling me that he needed help, he wanted to come with me. Maybe I'm just a sap, but in any case, I could tell that he felt content with me. It didn't take long to build trust, and I'm happy to finally introduce Big Tony and his new vivarium.